Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I am Reverend Ray Kareem and I serve as the interim uh, young adult leadership program development coordinator uh, with the National Benevolent Association of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Um, the NBA is a general ministry of the Disciples Church, and we are a nonprofit organization that collaborates with leaders and with health and social services to strengthen, transform, to strengthen and transform communities through compassion, healing, and justice. The NBA provides education, companionship, inspiration, and resources for organizational and leadership development for health and social, social service ministries. All of our work with our partners is grounded in our historic mission of justice and advocacy. As we get started, I would like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on the NBA website at nbacares.org. As you may follow along with, also, pardon me, you may follow along via the automated transcription using the AI generated captions. You can look for the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, today's um, webinar is about the Zillennial <laughs> uh, generation. And at the end of our um, presentation, we will allow time for questions. Prior to that, though, I want to let you know that we are here to talk about Gen Z, the Zillennial generation, um, as they are being ushered into adulthood. We are offering a panel discussion, which you are a part of this evening, with young adults and young adult leaders and supporters that makes room for exploration and engagement with young adult culture. We will take a close look at what informs daily life for young adults in the following areas, faith and spirituality, justice, community, mental health, and wellness. We will also hear about the support they have and the support that they need. Finally, we will take a look at how, that, how those same areas of daily life and culture affect ministry leaders as well as supporters of young adults. This evening, we have with us Mrs. Alexa Deva, who is a um, MDiv student at Disciples Divinity House, um, which is a part of the University of Chicago Divinity School. We have Isaac, who is a peer learning and wellness group facilitator and is also involved with Over Hispania. We have Reverend Alexis Tardy, who is pursuing her doctor, uh, doctor of ministry degree in womanist preaching at Memphis Theological Seminary. And she is also a member of La Luce, which is a peer learning and wellness group of MBA. We have Reverend Jimmy Gone, who is an ordained disciples minister and currently serving as the chaplain on board the USS Chosen in Seattle, Washington, and has pre previously served as a U.S. Marine Corps and Coast Guard in the U.S. Marine Corps and Coast Guard units. And then we have Pastor Verzola Law, who is the pastor of Northway Christian Church in Dallas, Texas, and who has been a part of the Young Adult, young adult Leadership Development as contract staff with MBA since 2014. Um, Rizola will be our moderator, facilitator of this discussion for the evening. Um, and again, if you have any questions, if you will be so kind to either post those in the chat or write them down, take a note so that we can get to them at the end, that would be greatly appreciated. And so we will now pass this along to Reverend Rizola. Hello, beloved. It's so good to hear you, to see you, to feel your presence across the virtual airways. I came to learn. I got my water so I can stay thirsty. I have a pen. I have my phone. I have my journal. I expect to discover something from those who are in another generation. Lean in with curiosity and wonder with us. Open to their own uh, truth and narratives and to see where it's going to take us. So let's get in. Fasten your seatbelts. It is time to go. Want to know again, we've heard your names and where you're from, but want to know a little bit more about faith and spirituality. And so I have some questions for, for Alexa and Isaac uh, around uh, faith and spirituality. I uh, want to hear a little bit from Alexis around justice and all of y'all going to talk about the community and then the mental health and wellness. Isaac kind of lean into you there. 
where uh, where are you? Well, how do you want to kick us off as you think about your particular uh, piece? I want you to say this with me. Come off mute, all of y'all, right now. Would you say this one thing with me? I am. I am. I am the content expert. The content, the content expert. expert. <laughs> you are the content expert of your own life. You are the content expert. We do not know about your generation like you do. We think we know. Let me tell you, we don't. <laughs> and so we are literally here because you are the content expert. So kicking us off, Alexa, you want to talk about um, just kind of where you are and what you're thinking about the particular changes and challenges and inspirations and discoveries of this young adult culture. Um, we'll start off with Alexa. Why don't you kick us off? Sure. So um yeah, I said that I was interested in talking about spirituality as it relates to being a 28-year-old, um, and I want to contextualize it within this kind of after COVID, not to say COVID is over, but just to say that like in the context of this three years after COVID began and um I guess I was thinking about how um, for my peers, what I'm noticing is that a lot of us um, have, you know, been a lot more interested in spirituality than like the institution of the church. And um, I'm also seeing that, um, a lot of people are turning to um, therapy to address concerns of mental health, but then maybe not so much turning towards spiritual resources for other aspects of navigating life. And um, I am a proponent of therapy. I also go to therapy, but I'm also seeing that it kind of produces this culture where people relegate certain needs to going to like belong to therapy versus um being um yeah like certain vulnerabilities i i i see this other effect where um people kind of keep their vulnerabilities to themselves and rather than being in community um and i guess when i think about spirituality it's meeting slightly different needs than therapy that I think maybe um, my peers have kind of lost a sense of those needs and um, or of, of 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 being connected to spiritual needs. Um, um, so that, those are some things that I was thinking of All right. in terms All of spirituality. Right. Yeah. All right. Isaac, coming to you, what's coming up for you and the changes, challenges, inspirations, discoveries for this young adult culture? Yes, ma'am, of course. Uh, one of the main things that I've been not, uh, that I've been seeing a lot of lately, uh, both personal experience as well as just what I've been seeing out in general, is there is a, a different type of hunger that's been kind of like a rising and awakening in the younger generations. Uh, I would say a little bit of my generation as well. Uh, I am 33, so I'm like right there when it comes to millennial. Um, but as well as the newer generation, as far as Gen Z, Zillennial, and even the younger ones where we're, even on the news, we're seeing revivals in schools. You know, we're seeing this this new hunger. And I, I heard this, uh, this quote, and I don't remember where I saw it, but I saw it like, I think I want to say in 2021, and it's it stuck with me where it said that um, the younger people, the younger generation are leaving the church to find Jesus. So when it comes to faith and spirituality, the, the discoveries that I'm seeing is that we're stepping out of this box of religion, of what the, the traditional church is that we probably grew up in or that we've come to know where. You know, it's this structure and it's this, this, uh, there's, there's etiquette, there's form, there's, you know, certain rules and regulations that we need to abide by and just kind of uh, get familiar with and just play church, essentially. Well, 
that's that's the change I've seen. Where this there for as far as faith and spirituality, this hunger for Jesus is coming from outside of the church. You know where, and I'm 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 blessed enough to be the the youth leader at the church that I attend, and the focus that I've gone with them and what I try to have with them is is to step away from well I'm here to give the message you guys listen and then hopefully you learn something and then we can go on and I'll see you next Sunday uh the format I've adopted is a conversation let's have this conversation let's uh I want to know what you guys are thinking I want to know why you think the way you think or the questions you might have and that's where I'm starting to learn from them because they have all the access in the world now you know they have access to anything they can possibly want in, in the palm of their hands. So if they want to know about Jesus, you know, it's, it's, it's deeper than just Googling Jesus. You know, it's just deeper than going to mom and dad or going to pastor and saying, hey, I want to know about Jesus. A lot of the times we're going to get a scripted answer as far as what Jesus is, but they have their, you know, ability to, to, to do that deep dive and learn to build that more personal versus let's follow the rules. This is Jesus, now let's follow Jesus' rules versus this is Jesus, let's build a relationship with Jesus. And it, it's, it's, a, it's truly a beautiful thing. I mean, there's extremes on both sides, uh, however you look at it, but it is, it's a beautiful thing, what's, what, I, what I see happening with the younger generation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm coming now to Alexis. I feel like the DJ are the Zoom queen. And so I'm going to move on over. Alexis, can you tell us in terms of what what, what are the ways that you acknowledge, see uh, your perspective, uh, content expertise and uh, the changes, challenges, inspirations, discoveries for this young adult culture? Yeah, thank you for that great question and for the, the great answer so far. Um, I think there's a real longing for um, realness, for lack of a better word. Um, I think there is a lack of um, connectedness to community struggle um, with churches. Um, and justice is where my heart is on that. Um, and I think when you when churches don't speak to the real issues that young adults are going through or that young adults are seeing in their day to day, um, that's where you lose them. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there are a lot of studies and I'm sure there are nuances to this, but the studies that say young adults are, are leaving the church. Um, I don't think it's that simple, but I do think that a lot of young adults are discontent with the church, um, myself included, <laughs> um, because I think there's a lack of. Um, connection in a in a, a separation of spirituality and justice or theology and faith or faith and spirituality um it's almost as though they're divorced from each other and so when you go in you're part of the church but you can't bring justice with you um and i think that is something that comes to be like untenable at some point <laughs> especially if you are a christ follower or you follow jesus it just doesn't make sense in terms of our discipleship to not be connected to justice work. And I think that churches who are not connected to some type of communal struggle, or at least an organization that is uh, working on issues in the community is where you lose um, a lot of young adults today um, because young adults want something that speaks to their real lived experience and that speaks to the issues in the world as well. Um, so that's something that I see being kind of a, a tension or a disconnect um, with young adults. And I think that churches or faith communities miss out when young adults are not there. I think just like any other, um, any other like person or community, you're missing out when young adults are not a part of your congregation. Um, you're missing out on their voices, you're missing out on their gifts. And something about the community is not whole if young adults are not actively a part of your congregation. Um, so that's something that I, I think about often. And then Isaac, let's see, you, you've you gone. Let me see, am I missing somebody? Did I miss somebody? Tim, you're, who y'all are moving when somebody comes off the screen. Okay, see this with the a, a little age, a little silver, a little silver. All right, I see you now, Jimmy. We're ready. Go. 
Okay, so Rizola, I will ask this. Which question in particular would you like me to start with? Really just uh, uh, what are the changes, challenges, inspirations, discoveries for young adult culture? Okay, sure. Um, So I'll preface this by saying I am an elder millennial at 41. So most of what I'm going to talk about is what I have witnessed rather than personally experienced. Um, But the shift in culture I've seen, uh, I'm going to echo what everybody said so far about Gen Z engaging spirituality without needing the institution. And I think, I think there's a healthy distrust of the institution that they have. Um, And I was thinking about this just earlier today. Gen Z is the first generation we have that has by and large not been raised in any way by baby boomers. They were raised by Gen X and later. So they were raised by the rebel generations, if you will. And that gave them this idea that we don't have to trust in these institutions that we've been told you will trust in these or you will pay. We can do this our own way. We can understand Christ. We can understand this relationship with Jesus without it having to be moderated by a church. And I think there's benefits and drawbacks to that. But from what I have seen so far, they have taken what my generation tried to do with the emergent church movement 15 years ago, and they've actually done it. They've, they're doing this community of faith without having to have the support of the church. And I mean, as somebody who grew up in the church, as somebody who's been a disciple for 40 years of my life, there's a bit of tentativeness to that on my part. But I also know that as I get older, my generation needs to step back and trust the next generation in a way that my generation didn't necessarily receive. We learned that lesson the hard way, and we need to make sure that Gen Z actually gets to lead from the very start. All right, we're going to come back to you um, and talk about vision, um, given that you are um, coming towards the more mature side and um, those who are mature in energy and uh, edginess. I, I think about uh, the different generations and there's this time you have this capacity of energy um, that, that doesn't always stay with you. So I hear you as you're talking about uh, both the idea, but also the energy, the capacity to do it. So do it now because you only have this window. So I want to go a little bit deeper uh, in the particular areas. So Alexa, just around faith and spirituality, I know that you are really uh, spending some time honing in on that. Would you talk to us a little bit more about how these aspects of culture correlate with each other and inform uh, the daily life, the daily grind, the back and forth, the 24-7? 60, what is it? 24 hours in a day, right? 60 minutes in an hour. Keep on, I'm gonna I'm I'm go on mute. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, so I am in divinity school and a d- disciples um, scholar at U Chicago, but I did not grow up with the disciples. I came to the disciples within the last five years. And um, I grew up in kind of non-denominational, which just means secretly Baptist context. And I, um, being in the disciples and um, seeing the structures in place to have an open um, communion table, I think is an aspect of spirituality that um, can really speak to people in my generation at large. Um, Alexis was talking about like, there is no separation between following Jesus and caring about justice. And when I think of the inclusivity of the communion table, I think um, at least for the Christians who are my age outside of the disciples, I think a lot about the spiritual implications of um, of that inclusivity and um, 
I don't really know what that will mean in terms of like the future of Christianity for people in my generation. Like I, I think about if that means, um, you know, dinner church as more of an institution versus um, Sunday morning church or um, yeah, I, I, I have, I don't know fully what I'm, what I'm thinking about, like the spiritual implications of the communion table as it relates to like embodied practice for my generation. But I, I know that that is something that has really like compelled me toward the disciples and something that I want to like kind of bridge across, like in an ecumenical way. I mean, which, you know, is also inherent to disciples, but, um, so those are some of the things I was thinking about with um, when we were asked to think about faith and spirituality as it relates to people my age. All right. All right. Well, we're going to ask Isaac, you go on and pick that up, this kind of connection, how they form and inform each other, uh, faith and spirituality. And then we have some more we can come back to you for, but just those two particular. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Uh, with When it comes to faith and spirituality i think there's there's um i want to say when it comes to like my generation and the younger one as well the ones you know kind of coming up there's this healthy curiosity when it comes to faith and spirituality because um just kind of to piggyback on what i said earlier where you know we have we have this respect for how we grew up like i grew up in the church as a ministry kid, um, and then about eight years ago, my my father became the pastor, and then I went from ministry kid to pastor's kid, even though I was already like in my twenties. But I, I, growing up in the church, there's this respect for uh, how how we did life, you know, how we did how we did that Christian life, and how we, you know, did church and 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 did things like that way. But again, it was more of a uh, almost religious aspect, you know, especially because nobody's perfect and, and we didn't see perfection. We were, uh, we were taught perfection through Jesus, but it was one of those things where it's like, well, we still went home and, you know, saw what we saw. We still went to school and saw what we saw. And it was one of those things where it's like, you know, you go to, you go to school on Monday and oh, what'd you do this weekend? Well, I went to church. It's normal. We do it every weekend. It wasn't crazy. It wasn't out of the box. And, Again, there's this healthy respect for how we grew up in the structure, but now as we're growing up and seeing the younger generation ask more questions that we didn't ask, it's like, well, well, hold on, you know, it's, we're not scared of those questions, but it's almost like, well, we didn't ask them because we were almost scared to ask them. You know, we, we almost didn't want to go to that subject or we didn't want to touch that or, you know, or, hey, don't, don't, don't talk about that. You know, it's not taboo, but it's just, we don't talk about that. Um, or, or talk to your parents, you know, we don't talk, we're not going to talk about in class at church, ask your parents at home, and then they can deal with that. And it's, it's flipped. Now people, the, the younger generation, especially, like I said, thank God it, it started kind of like when Jimmy said, it didn't necessarily work, but it's starting to work now to where it's like, well, now we're asking those questions. And now we do want to know, and we're coming here because we're supposed to, you know, this is what we were told that this is where, you know, a better understanding of these answers were. So now they're being asked. Now our, our curiosity was raised as a millennial, but now the questions are being asked by Gen Z. And it's good for us to have that connect of, of that respect of where we came from, you know, that, that reverence of what we were taught, but also being able to answer those questions honestly with that, you know, like I said, that's where the faith and the spirituality connect because it's we have the reverence, but now we have the answer to we we can answer those questions. Sure. Not religiously. One of the I uh, thank you. Got that y'all are y'all are y'all are cooking. Y'all are cooking. Um I maybe or maybe I'm just hungry, but y'all are cooking. Y'all cooking. I uh I am I'm just reminded of uh Cornel West's uh com commentations about justice and 
justice is what love looks like in, in public and showing my age uh one of the songs the lyrics that were popularized with the musical rent is one of the ways and i'm a i'm a uh i'm a um x y'all don't even know about who we are we just x that we're a survivor generation so i'm generation x and 525,600 minutes 525 moments so dear 500 25,600 minutes. How do we measure, measure a year? And as I think about just my own sensibilities when I was your age and justice, I can't wait to hear what this next person has to say. Alexis, come on and take us deeper into the conversation about justice and where you see these aspects of culture and how they correlate with each other and form and inform our 525,600. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I've loved the, the answer so far. And I um, I love Alexa where you're going with communion. Um, my first thought is around a millennial also as a millennial and what you were saying, Isaac. And I think at least for me, um, growing up, especially when you went to college is thinking you can change the world, right? <laughs> um, and then you join an institution and the college is telling you you're gonna change the world and all that good stuff. Um, and I think now I'm learning more and more. I think Jimmy was uh, saying this too. Like that's not going to come through institutions. Um, <laughs> and that's kind of a recent discovery, uh, which I think is why millennials and Gen Zers are maybe um, distrustful of institutions because I think a lot of, some work happens above ground and very important work can happen within institutions. But I think more often than not, the real work happens um, in what, um, when you think about like uh, slavery and plantations, what would happen to hush harbors? Like what would happen away from the slave master's eyes, right? Like this is something that happens at night. And I think a lot of the real justice work happens um, underground. And I think that that's something that um, a lot of young adults are seeking. And I think when we think about justice and the communion table, I was thinking a lot about the work of um, womanist M. Sean Copeland that talks about what it means to be human. Um, and how we have to like Jesus and, and uh, communion is like how we learn to be human again. Um, and I think that that's necessary in the church as well. And I think that's something that is um, inviting about the disciples um, theology in the church uh, around communion. I think that could be welcoming for all of us because we have to learn what it means to be human again. And I think once you do that work, there's no way you can separate that from the work of justice. But it's also the fact that you can't um, you can't always do that work within institutions that can be limiting, but that shouldn't stop the work. So how do we create hush harbors or areas of resistance um, so that we can still work toward liberation and not be limited by institutions? I promise y'all. I'm going to quote you and use your name in my sermons for the rest of Lent. Y'all are giving me material, giving me stuff to work with. Wow. So I'm going to do what our one of our mental health content experts with the National Benevolent Association, uh, Jocelyn Spence, tells us to just breathe. So would you all people on with us who will be watching the re-recording even come on from your diaphragm, breathe. And out. Again, let's breathe. And out. And that's taking us right down into this next aspect uh, and how our culture correlates because there's so much we've learned about trauma and so much in the last three year years we've learned specifically around mental health and wellness and um, how they form and inform our daily lives. So Isaac, I know that's a you're a content expert on that. Talk to us. Ma'am, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, I love where uh, Alexa was going with this at the, at the beginning, and it's, it's almost something that we're seeing a lot more. It's, it's become a lot more common. Um, our generation uh, going to therapy, you know, seeking out that type of uh, understanding. Because like I said, uh, there's a lot of questions that we have, and a lot of times, it's our parents and the older generation that we can't go to because, well, well you're the ones we're seeing it from. You know, the, when it comes to mental health and, and just general wellness, it's like we, we understand, growing up, we understand our parents a lot more. You know, we see the, the trauma that 
they've experienced and didn't even know how to label because the information wasn't around for them. And it was part of the, the that aspect where when it comes to you know minorities, it's like seeking help is you're weak. So they they didn't do it. It was just a matter of well, you'll get over it, you'll, or you'll you can you know refocus, just just get to work. You know you can't really you don't really have time for anything like that because you have a family to feed, you have you have work to do. And thank God that they worked that hard to give us the life that we have. But now that we have we don't have to work as hard as them. We have more time to think. And we're raised the way that we're raised better than they were raised, but there's still those, you know, those traumatic experience or that, you know, that generational traumas that end up following them. And even though they are doing it a little better, like I said, we, we start to see that and we start to ask questions. And I, 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 I thank God, you know, it's, I thank God for, you know, just the time that I'm in now, and you know, the age I'm at now to where, you know, we've been able to see technology move with us and help us ask those questions. I have a, I have a friend of mine who's actually a, a licensed therapist. And, you know, the conversation that I was having with her at one point was, is like, we're seeing such an influx in people interested in psychology you know, going to school to, for a psychology degree and, you know, sci, uh, uh, psychiatric uh, degrees and things like that. And, and going into those fields, uh, even as a minor, even if that's not something they're generally, or they, they shift their focus, like I went to school for this, but, you know, because this happened in my life, I started asking questions, I started taking classes. Now I want to be a therapist. And it's like, we're seeing such an influx in, in that, in that field because there's such a high demand. Like everybody is mental health and mental uh, wellness has boomed because people are interested in answering those questions. Now, I wanna know why I was so uh, angry. I wanna know why I was, you know, my parents didn't tell me I love you. And, it, and we learned growing up where it's like, well, maybe they never said the words, but they probably said, hey, thank you. Or they probably said it in a certain way. And I'm speaking from experience at that point, but we start to learn those things. And, it, and in taking that, it's like, okay, cool. Now I can teach you what I've learned, which is why I say, I, I thank God for the position that I'm in being a youth leader, because I've almost, I've almost restructured my class to be a group therapy session. Like, I, like Alexis, you know, like I've been in therapy myself. I've been in group therapy and I've been on one-on-one -on -one therapy. And the one thing that I've adopted in my class was I do check-ins. As soon as we come in, everybody's inside. All right, check in. What's something? And it can be as simple as, oh, well, I had a math test today. Okay, cool. Awesome. Did you pass? No, I do better. Or, oh, you know, my my grandma's sick, you know, and our family's going through that. Okay, well, how do you feel? It's It's a matter of pulling that out and allowing them the safe space to be able to talk because, you know, as, as awesome as therapy is, I don't want you to have to need it. <laughs> but apart from that, just like with, with the spirituality and faith aspect, the information's available to them. You know, they can, if they want to ask, ask the questions, everything is on their phone. You know, nothing can be hidden from them. They can, if they have, if they want to Google, you know, generational trauma, they can have a million different references as to what that is and what they can do themselves. So having that available to them is, it's, it's encouraging, but at the same time, it's also a matter of creating a safe space for them. That way it's not weaponized, you know what I mean? Because that can easily happen as well. But um, I just, I, I think it's beautiful what's happening. And I, I that's why I, that's why I personally, I'm just like, I'm so yeah. enthusiastic about it. One of the things, yeah, we talk about safe space, but it really causes, I hear some of y'all some brave space. And so how do we equip, how do we give that, that space for bravery, for courage to enter into these spaces? Thank you so much. Um, I know, Jimmy, you're ready to get in there. And I know you. All, we also want to hear from the younger end, but don't want to forget about Jimmy. So um, I know there's some vision. So I'm going to ask one more question. Let them ask one more series of questions, bring you back in and then come back because I have a six-year-old granddaughter turned six last week who's already set an appointment with me 
based on which the conversation she's had with her therapist at six, what I need to do to get my life better in terms of the way we have conversations. So um, she has me on a time and has a set schedule an appointment with like me to meet her at the lake. Um, so I have to keep y'all moving because y'all need to get ready for that generation. All right. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? Where do you see the church and your community I mean, organizations in five to 10 years? Alexis, I want to hear from you. Where do you see the church, the community, and your organization? If you see good, what can you do to participate in it? If you don't see good, in what ways can you engage that good? If it's neutral, are you engaging in ways to see good? Who can you partner with? Just You see, I got a lot of questions. So talk to us, Alexis. Yeah, I never get it like the five to 10 year questions, even for myself. So I'm going to I'm going to work in the last part of what you were saying. Um, yeah, I think there are ways that um, I think there are ways that the church is engaging in good. Like I, I think about the Sam and Dewitt Proctor Conference uh, that I went to a few weeks ago. That's always a place of hope for me um, where um, black justice preachers come and gather and uh, preachers who have been doing the work. Um, locally, I've been working with um, a local committee around political prisoners, and I've been um, helping to do that work in churches as well. And so what I've been hearing, as much discontent I've heard from young adults, I've also, I'm also starting to hear from pastors being like, I want to engage in justice work, I just don't know how. <laughs> so um, I think hopefully, like, in the next few years, or maybe in this time of like, not post COVID, but I don't know, this stage of COVID um, where pastors have really had to pivot, but also a lot of our needs have come to the surface in ways that we can't ignore. I'm hoping that the church will learn to engage and really re-engage um, with the ethos that we are following, which is Jesus, right? So, um, it's interesting to me when folks don't know where to start <laughs> when we follow Jesus and look at scripture. So maybe just re-engaging Jesus um, and Jesus's ministry so that churches have a good starting point of what we should be doing in our own time, but also engaging, again, the communities um, that churches are in or communities of struggle that churches are in already to start doing that work. Um, so maybe my hope for the church is that the world will look a lot differently than what it does now. Um, I think apathy and allowing, um, I don't know, just allowing what we see on a day to day to be what it is, is just really unacceptable to me as a person, but also as a Christ follower. So I'm hoping that, that the church becomes a church again. Are y'all still snapping like a uh, clapping? Or, <laughs> what, am I, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Cause you know, church, I'm just substance to shout and they look at me like, did she just do that we don't do that but quiet churches make me nervous all right so we are going to keep moving church uh whether you are uh moving to action with your voice or your feet uh we want to keep this moving and create this lively energetic conversation with uh just again want to uh, ask uh isaac and alexa one more uh question and then jimmy i know you got a vision to just blow us out the water. I can't wait to hear as you are discovering marching orders uh, as we hear from the, the this group. Uh, name what you celebrate about the church uh, or organization and what you think hinders the church. So what do you celebrate and what, what, what's hindering us? Uh, I'm gonna let Isaac go. Uh, you just got to talk. Let me let Alexa go. Let me let you breathe again. Come on, come on back, Alexa. Um, yes. So with hindering, I'll start with hindering. Um, I think like the unwillingness to change is something that I've noticed and unwillingness to, and that filters in to a lot of different things. There's just like a fear of, um, doing something differently um and that's not really unique to church either like I would say across the board after the pandemic we have gone through this collective trauma and there's like 
very like real mental health implications of like low energy and depression. And that just like is really demotivating to try something new and do something different. Um, so I think, yeah, an unwillingness to change. And at least in the congregation that I've been in, and I speak about this with them, so I think it would be okay to say, but like, and and, and we want to know, they want to know this too, like, um, a, um, there's a, it's a struggle to like get the congregation, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, but to get the whole congregation to like lay claim to the church in a way that, um, yeah, in a way that's like energizing um, and in a way that like really meets, like meets, helps people meet each other's needs rather than just putting all of the needs on the pastor. And so some, some, the pressure to meet needs just on the pastor. Um, so when I say that an unwillingness to change, I think that's, that's not really like from a leadership perspective, that's just from like the state of being human in the U.S. at least right now. It's just like, uh, um, there's something that needs to be dislodged. Um, and then there are a lot of things that I celebrate about the church that, which is why I still want, yeah. which is why I'm still here. Um, one is that, so because we've gone through all this collective trauma, one gift, huge gift that I see of Christianity, um, in the church is the ability to hold space for grief and collective, um, lament, um, and giving, I think some, I think Alexis used the word realness, just being upfront about the fact that things are bad and really pulling on the Psalms to, um, hold collective space for grief is one thing that I celebrate about the church. And one thing that I would like to see it, um, lean into and also, um, you know, Christianity's ability to hold both good and evil and um, hold that tension inside of us. Um, I think obviously like the political climate in this country is such that we really see things as good and bad. And I think that the church has a really, um, really has the capacity or has the potential to be able to um, give nuance to that and really make spaces for repair and cross um, dialogue in a state where people are just like pretty dualistic in their thinking. I hope that was coherent, but those are some of yeah, my- I mean, I, y'all, I'm, I'm taking my notes. I'm trying to figure out where to put them on, which device, because this is such good stuff. I I am going to come back after Jimmy because we got to push it. I just want, don't be afraid to push it. Since you got the stage and you are the content expert, come on, push it. Can we push it a little bit further? Isaac, Isaac, uh, what do you celebrate? Yeah. What do you celebrate and what hinders us, the church, the organizations? Yeah, because uh, Alexa pushing it some more. Y'all pushing us, so let's push. Oh, I, I love it. I love it, and I, I love uh, that we're almost on the same page. You know, it's like the, you know different words, but we're on the same. We're in the same chapter. Um, one thing that I definitely celebrate from the church is, especially when it comes to again uh, my generation and where we are and how the church is looking now, is. Uh, there's this newfound level of empathy and compassion and understanding for the people. You know, uh, like I said, growing up in the church, there was always structure, there was reverence, there was a certain level of respect um, that was always maintained. And it's still there, but now we've added the, that empathy, that understanding, that compassion, just a little bit more, not that it wasn't there, but it's a little bit more to the forefront because again, it's, it's, you know, we have this 
view of, well, we're all going to mess up. You know, we're all constantly messing up. So, you know, you can't. Yes, the idea is to, you know, we're a new creation in Christ and we're all saints. But the matter of the fact is that everyone's still going to be struggling with something. And we can't constantly, even though we try to preach perfection through Jesus, you know, it's something we try to imitate. But at the same time, there still has to be this empathy that if I'm not perfect, I know you're not. So I can't treat you like you're supposed to be when I'm not. And I think that I, I think that's starting to become a little bit more um, a little bit more obvious in the churches and in our community and just in our families. I'm again speaking from personal experiences, but I've seen it enough to where I can say it's starting to happen, you know, that domino effect of of empathy and compassion is starting to just uh, make its way through the church and it's uh, I, I personally like it but I but on the same you know on the other side of that coin one thing that I or, or something that I do see almost hindering the church is um, almost the lack of tolerance but the one that I really see the most is a fear of growth and not a growth in numbers because obviously like everybody we want to see the church packed every Sunday we want to see new new faces but there's a fear of growth that I've seen for myself and that I've experienced that I think that it's just been there without being labeled where you know we have members of the church for 5 10 15 20 years and we've just been members of the church you know when God calls us to be disciples and disciples disciple disciples like they're supposed to be this continuation of things we're supposed to do as we walk you know in the will of uh, walking in the, along the will of God and the assignments that we have the people that we're supposed to reach you know the when it comes to you know like what, what Alexis says when it comes to justice and community there's things we're supposed to do more than just being members and sitting in the pews every Sunday and I think that fear of growth is is hindering the church in general, because it's 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 easy to say, well, I'm not going to bother them because at least they're coming every Sunday. And, and if I push them, they won't come back. And we're starting to see that. And that's why I say it's almost like rocking the boat, but you kind of have to rock the boat because we need to know who's in this. We need to know who I can lean on, who I can trust, who I can disciple, who I know can disciple someone else. And like I said, I, I try to be as real as I possibly can without being overbearing to my to my you know my class, my students, and I tell them like my assignment right now is to be the youth leader at ICBE for you guys. This doesn't mean I'm going to be here next year or in five years or ten years. My job is to teach you guys so that one of you will take my spot, so that I can do whatever else God needs me to do. If I'm if I'm called to stay here for twenty years, I'll do it. But if God wants me to go somewhere else and help here and go here and do this, one of you needs to take over. And there's that growth that we need to start encouraging, that that spiritual growth that we need to start encouraging all over the church. So I feel like that's what hinders us, but there's so much potential for it. I, I um, Y'all are preaching, teaching, uh, marching. Y'all doing all of it. I want to put a little organ. I, I found myself rocking, dancing. I'm Yes, I mean, Alexis, I hear you in the re-engaging Jesus and just uh, being human, the re the realism and uh, and Alexis in your talk and Alexa to say, I'm still here. I'm 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 actually here and I choose to be here. And how do you hold space for these tensions and to, to say there's space and let's create in our liturgies and our ways the space for collective lament and in our faith we have this space in the psalms to be able to hold the tension of the good and the bad and and then uh to check in and not check out isaac and and how do we create a, a practice of doing that and to do that with the kind of compassion but we don't have to fear growth now i have a question for you but i'm gonna come to jimmy because i'm trying to figure out how to grow and it not hurt I'm trying to figure out how, how do we grow? How do we change? And I don't have to go through it. I'm just asking, is there a pill that can help me grow, be better? And I don't have to feel it. I'll, we'll come back because there's some questions at the end. Jimmy, I know you have some vision. 
the future for the church, for our larger church, for the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, the United States in Canada as a denomination, especially the areas of service and compassion. Talk to us. So yeah, um, and, and that vision creating it is very interesting. And I, I want to say before I start getting into this, I did spend the last month in a 505 foot long ship on the Pacific Ocean with 300 of my closest friends. So if I start talking Navy and I'm not comprehensible, please somebody rein me in. Um, just send up a flare in the comments and I'll I'll stop. <laughs> but, um, and I'll translate might be the more accurate thing to say. But, you know, a lot of what I see in terms of the future of the church has a lot to do with what I see on a very on a much smaller scale with the young men and women that I work with in the Navy and in the Marine Corps. Now, looking at Generation Z, in my context especially, we have a generation that has never known a time when this country was not at war. On the flip side of that, we have a generation that never had to hide their sexuality if they wanted to be in the military. Millennials had to do that from the late 90s up until it was until Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed in 2010. But every Gen Z service member who has joined has been able to join wholly as themselves with the exception of some gender identity things that we are still trying to work out. One of these days, everybody will be able to join exactly as they are and exactly as who they are. Still working on that. May God help us. Um, but one of the shifts that I think we're going to have to see to properly be the church for Gen Z is we're going to need to stop worrying about religion. And I know that that might be a contradictory thing for a pastor to say, but we have gotten so tied up in religion that we don't worry about faith. We don't worry about justice. We don't worry about why we're here to be the beloved community. We especially don't worry about mental health. And as has been repeatedly said, Gen Z has figured out how to worry about mental health and engage it and actually take care of themselves. You know, my generation, the millennials, we looked at our mental health challenges and said, this is something we need to overcome and not be defined by them. That is not something Gen Z has done. Gen Z has said, this is part of who I am. I will not be defined by this. I will define it. I will accept it as part of me. I will live honestly. I will live a genuine life. And I think millennials are starting to get that. We are we're, we're, we're looking at what Gen Z is doing and say, hey, that, that looks a lot easier. Can, can we do that too? Um, but I think mental health is going to be a huge piece of the future of the church. And I think it's going to be a huge piece of the clergy of the future of the church. I don't think my wife is sitting on the other side of the room, snapping her fingers. She's both a ordained minister and a social worker. So she's all about this. Um, but I don't think that just being ordained clergy is going to be enough for those of us who are in those leadership roles in the church going forward. We're going to have to have some understanding of what it means to work with mental health. We're going to have to have some understanding of how to help people build, for lack of a better way of putting it, toughness and resiliency working through mindfulness techniques, working through resources like the Enneagram to help you build an emotional understanding of yourself. That is what I see in the future of the church. I don't see, I, I mean, we're still going to have brick and mortar buildings because they're already there. We might as well use them to the best of our ability, but I don't see those being the important piece of the church in the future. I see engaging in all of those different elements being the future of the church, the church that's actually going to be the church rather than just be a building, an institution. 
Well, we we building the church. We are restoring some things, but building some things. And uh, let, let's get busy. Let's get busy. Um, and then let's find a way to be still and do nothing and see what happens. I mean, let's do both. Can we do both, Alexa? Can we get busy and be still? Can we run and rest? I, I just, I, I, y'all make me believe we can. And there might be, there are questions that are coming up now. Y'all have pushed us, uh, you, you, you all who are having vision and sharing. So the first question from the audience, Alexa spoke about not everyone talking, taking claim to meeting each other's needs. In what ways can we emphasize taking responsibility for nurturing everyone's needs, not just the pastor's needs, the people's spiritual needs, or how can we encourage the elder generations to take responsibility for the younger ones and not just lay it all on the pastor? So this idea of needs and who has responsibility, how do we how do we hold all of those tensions? Alexa, it's your it came from uh it, your 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 statements prompted this question. So go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um I also invite my other panelists to speak into this if they have suggestions or ideas. Um, but I think one of the things goes back to um, having a culture in which it's okay to say that you're not okay, which it seems like Gen Z is totally comfortable with. But there also needs to be a precedent congregationally where people are like telling the truth um, about themselves and also somehow like to each other about, um, yeah, something that has to do with truth telling and doing that in love. Um, and that goes back to justice too. Like when, when we harm each other, how do we tell each other that? Um, I think yeah, a culture of like truth telling and honesty may help to create spaces where people are um, taking responsibility for each other. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, th that's, that's one thing that's coming to mind. Um, all right, all right. Yeah, you all can come back. I want to come with another question if because our time is going to run out and, and then if anyone wants to circle around, uh, second questions come. What does practicing faith, like the tangible outward expression of faith, look like more progressive Gen Zers, especially since they we aren't leaning on institutions to have that education? Uh, so, one of y'all want to take that one. What does it look like practicing this outward faith? Um, I think it looks. I'm going to say, how does the practice of outward, outward faith looks like for Gen Z? Um, I think, well, one thing I'm seeing a lot more, and I think that it's becoming a lot more common, um, is uh, at least something that I didn't experience, but I'm seeing a lot more of, and I think it's the best thing in the world, which is the life groups, you know, small groups coming from um, those type of environments, even from even within the church itself, uh, which is something that I've, I'm I'm new to. But you know, I've always been at churches with humble sizes, so there was never enough to create different groups. Uh, but I'm seeing it a lot more now, and I, and I see that a lot with uh, again my generation and the younger generation as well, to where that's it's. Uh, they they have their source of what they're looking for. You know, they have these, you know, everything's online now. Every every pastor, every preacher, every message is online. So you can go through and see which one I want to I want to listen to. And then you have your life groups. You have, you know, the gathering of four or five friends getting together and discussing. And it's like, well, what's your opinion on that? And again, if we don't have these traditional institutions of you know, uh, well, you know, going to seminary or even going to, a, like you said, a brick and mortar church, but, you know, church is where we are. We are the church. Church is where two or three are, are gathered in the name of God. Like that's, that's where God is. And if we gather to learn from what we're seeing, then that's, that's, that's growth there, you know, and, and even then, you know, even 
even having that spiritual maturity or saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to attend this. You know, I come from the, the old school religion, old school church, that reverence, but I'm also going to step in here because I like what you guys are doing. And I can see that this is working for you and it's even benefiting me. Now we can start to add, well, you know, listen to that message. That's not right. You know, or you, you start to, that's where the, the, the fire of the Holy Spirit, in, in my opinion, starts to come in because it's like, well, that preacher is saying something, but, you know, there's there's something in, in me that's not really connecting with that, you know, and now I have questions. Why did he say it like that? Why did he say that message? Why is that going that way? And then there's the, there's the research. There's the questions among the small group, among the friends, among the life group who aren't, like I said, sometimes aren't even comfortable going to a bigger church because again, uh, the, the, the claim of, of, you know, and I don't want to quote it to saying that it's not real, but church hurt of what they called it, you know, where I don't want to go there anymore because they blame the, the structure of the church for things that they've experienced and not saying that it's not real, but it's, it's just, it's what it is out there. So they're more comfortable now with the smaller groups, with the life groups and being more intentional Instead of just sitting on a Sunday, listening to a message of the preacher saying you're wrong for living the way you're living, and then going home and just sitting there thinking, man, well, what am I doing wrong? Versus now creating conversation within that group of saying, well, this is what I was told. This is how I'm feeling. This is the conviction I have. What do you guys think? Where are you guys at? So, you know, discussion becomes prayer and prayer becomes, you know, encouragement. So, uh, I think it's, I think it's okay. You know, like I said, I don't think it's not, not every, not every situation is going to require the the institution of the a church or building or seminary or things like that. It's, it's, it's the desire. It's, it's that, it's that desire and the hunger that's going to get you closer to Christ than a curriculum. That desire and hunger. I know some of you might be fasting, but I'm getting hungry and the hour is <laughs> the hour is going. So I I this has been so rich. I know Jimmy, you might have some things to chime in. So we also want to invite all of you who have joined us. Uh there might be additional questions. So before we get ready to start wrapping up, what other questions are coming up for you? Um um discussion becomes prayer and prayer becomes encouragement. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. Um, all of this is generative. It's it, it's it's springtime. I don't know if it's springtime where you are because it's a little cold, but it, it's springtime coming. What other questions? I want to give the panel then time to come back. What what other what like this? I must say, I I I, for, I, I forgot this. I they, we they got to hear this because I can tell it's a part two. I can tell there's more to come um, as we're listening and learning because you are the content experts. You are the content experts. Y'all gonna write that. You gonna get that, hashtag it. You are the content experts. What What is it this, mu I must say? One of the things I wanted to mention uh, while we're here is just, again, this is an observation of, um, the millennial generation, how we did so, how we did certain things, and Gen Z, how they're doing things. You know, and this is specifically about justice, but it can be expanded to other institutional considerations as well. Um, my generation, we advocated for change through systemic change, policies, political movement. Uh, you know, when I was in college, my time in college included 9-11. Afghanistan and Iraq. And we, as a generation, thought that we could change things through policy and working within the system. And we found out that the system is rigged, basically. And so Gen Z has come along and said, you know what? This looks like it would burn real nice. And they are in the process of doing their darndest to burn every worthless institution they can to the ground and build something new on top of those ashes. And I am excited to see what they build. Because I know that, you know, 
I don't know if I'll retire at 55 like Levites were required to, um, but I know that my time is coming soon when I need to start stepping back from saying, hey, this is what I think we need to do in the church. And I am very excited to see what the young men and women who were in my youth groups when I was a pastor was starting out, what they do with the church in the future and other institutions for that matter. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, burning stuff now. Wait, okay. I, I was gonna say, I saw that question and I just immediately was like, ooh. Um, it says, should pastors risk being vulnerable to share their own mental health journeys to create space where others can express their journeys of faith, hope, and love and the strengths found in Jesus? Um, honestly, I thought about this a lot. I, I love that somebody asked. I didn't even read the name, but I love that somebody asked that because I, that is something I personally have struggled with. You know, when it comes to like your own personal testimony, your own personal uh, vulnerabilities, because it's almost like some sins, some struggles are more accepted than others. Um, you know, some are more tolerated than others. Um, not ne not just necessarily accepted, but tolerated. And I think that's it's it's almost shaky. It's like I want to encourage because I, I like I said, it's it's something I I hold. I've questioned myself a million times where it's like, how vulnerable can I be and with who, you know, when it comes to like a pastor being vulnerable with the church, it's almost dangerous because you're just, you're giving everybody ammo and everybody has their own thoughts. And in my opinion, not everybody is spiritually mature to handle certain levels of vulnerability. So to answer that question, yes, but be just careful with who. Um, your, uh, I, I would even personally say those to the, your team, your own support system, uh, as a pastor or as you know what what the, whatever title it is you might hold, um, you know that support system should definitely know and just be aware of those type of vulnerabilities um, when it comes to the general church. Um, it shouldn't be something that's hidden, but and also not freely offered. Because again, there's a level of spiritual maturity that not everyone's going to have, especially when you have brand new members and all of a sudden the preacher is talking about everything they used to do back in the day. And it's like, oh, snap. Okay, do I want to come here because the pastor's cool or should I leave because this pastor's crazy? You know, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's shaky ground. But um, I, I think that as we're going, as, as the years are coming and as the, the church is growing, like I said, like spiritually growing in a new way, I think it's, 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 it's a lot easier to be vulnerable, especially, like I said, with that inner circle, with the group that you, you know is there to support you with the ones that truly understand. That's why I say empathy is, is something that's growing in the church, compassion, understanding, because again, we all have our baggage. We all have our testimonies. We're all sinners. We're all going to have those different types of stories. And some of them are going to be way crazier than others, you know? And then I think that it's just, it's again, it's not something that should be hidden, but at the same time, just careful with who has that because it, it needs to be protected at the same time. And, and it can be easily, even though it's, you know, even though we're, we're called by God, regardless of where we come from, it's our testimony can be tarnished by humans because they're human. So I don't know. Hopefully that makes sense. Cause like I said, that's, that's something that's been rattling in my head for me personally. Like I said, we were all, we all have our stories. Yeah. And the story going back to this kind of institutionalism church and reburning, burning, creating, recreating, um, how can a ministry like the national benevolent association, um, what are the, some of the questions you have for us? What are some of the things you would need for um, from those kinds of engagement and partnerships and support? Uh, how can ministries like us, the NBA, further engage and support young adults?
See if I say if I give you a million dollars, what can we do? That maybe that'll get you. I'll going. take it. Mm-hmm. No, well, I, that's I what just, I was... I... may I chime in? It's Yanni. We got somebody coming from the audience, Johnny. What 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 would you say? Well, yeah, it was about this money factor. Um, I know a lot of the grants that MBA gives away are for younger adults and for seniors. So wondering what it might look like uh, for some more opportunities for uh, this zillennial uh, demographic um, to receive some of that grant funding uh, for our, our folks. It's been a little hard uh, trying to navigate and you know meet the criteria um, for our age group. So just uh, dropping that as a point. I will be happy to answer that question for you, Yanni. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, we also recognize that, and as a part of what Young Adult Leadership Development Programming is um, is presenting, is introducing, is an area called special grants. And so there will be opportunities for young adults to be able to <clears throat> um, apply for and hopefully access funds um, when it comes to special projects around ministry, um, around vocation. So we have heard that and we are doing the best that we can to be able to um, support that type of endeavor, those types of endeavors. Thank you, thank you, thank you, y'all. I don't believe in meeting just to meet and prolonging. Uh, and I see just... Uh, uh, mute button. So any uh, from the panel, this I must say, any other questions from those who gathered at this virtual table? Well, it has been my pleasure. Isaac, you about to say something? No, well, I was just going to express my gratitude for uh, panels like this, you know, the discussions that we have, because like I said, this is this isn't something that we've seen often, you know, obviously, the technology makes it a lot easier. Um, usually, these are types of things that you'd have to go to, you know, you'd have to sign up or you'd have to hear about it, you know, word of mouth. And um, but the technology now has made it so much easier. And I think that's that's something that you know, like I expressed, expressed a second ago, you can go on YouTube and find this. You know, anybody can find it. Anybody can stumble across uh, across something like this. And I think it's, uh, I think it's awesome. Like, I think it's awesome. I think it's, uh, it's very necessary. And it's something that I hope we can do more of. Like I said, we mentioned a part two. Well, I'm down for a part two. I'm down for a part 15. Because these are types of discussions, in my opinion, that shouldn't stop. You know where there's there's like it's, there's constant growth and there's constant need for um, for just that self awareness and the awareness in general of what um, we need not just as a generation but as a church in general. So I, I thank you guys for for the invitation allowing me to come on here. Um, I will say that this is all beautiful music to my ears. <laughs> um, just got a comment that that there can be con uh, continued conversations. I know that there was a question about a part two. And Isaac, you said we can go as, part, as far as part 15 and you will be more than happy to participate. So thank you so very much for all of you all for your time and your presence today, um, not only to our audience, but especially to our um, to our participants, want to say a special thanks to our moderator, um, Pastor Verzola Law, to our what she called content expert panelists, uh, Reverend Jimmy Gone, Minister Alexis Tardy, Alexa Davy, and Isaac Elizaradas. Did I say it right? Was I close? I tried. I tried. <laughs> So I'm very thankful for that opportunity to be able to um, say thank you, to be able to host you. I want to let you all know um, that I am about to put the information of our panelists in the chat box if you all are interested in learning more about who they are and what they do. Um, as well, the webinar was recorded, and so you will be able to find um, this beautiful conversation that we have had the opportunity to engage in on the website. 
And there are other ways um, that you can be involved and stay connected with NBA uh, by signing up for our newsletter at nbacares.org backslash newsletter. Um, again, that's nbacares.org, and I will put that in the chat box as well. Um, and then when you do that, feel free to check the boxes um, of what program areas you're most interested in, whether that's social uh, entrepreneurship, mental health and wellness, um, our peer learning and wellness groups, um, the mission and ministry grants, as well as young adult leadership development. We are thankful for your presence. Um, thank you for putting that in there, Will. I was just about to do it. We are thankful for your presence. Um, we are thankful for your time. And then there is yet another way that you can support us um, and stay involved, which is by way of your gifts. Everything that you do, um, everything that you give, pardon me, helps us to be able to do what we do as the NBA. It helps us to continue to create communities of compassion and care, um, supporting the work of justice and equity. We are always grateful for your donations nations um, whenever you give them and how however much that might be and I will also be sure unless we'll lead me to it he put that in there too thank you for our tech support making sure that those links um, are available to you thank you again for your time for your presence for your participation and know um, that we will be letting you know when part two part three on through part 15 take place uh, be sure to let other young adults know that these conversations are happening. We would love to be able to expand this conversation um, as well as be able to expand our reach. Other than that, you all have a very lovely evening. Um, enjoy spring, quote unquote, as much as you possibly can, depending on where you are and blessings to you. Thank you and good night.